Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, your host, Harry Simi. We've got a very, very special question and answers edition for you today. Uh, first of all, I've got to apologize for the lack of a podcast over the last few days and apologies for the really crappy virtual background. If you're watching me um, on YouTube, if you're listening on audio, you won't care. But basically, um, I owe you guys an explanation where I've been for the last few days. I'm currently in the process of moving house and um, I'm in between two places at the minute, which is not ideal. Uh, Everything is in utter chaos and uh, we're trying desperately to uh, to speed things up uh, and get everything sorted and get everything into the place we need to be. Had the Internet transferred over to the the new place but obviously um as is always the case with this type of thing not everything went as smoothly as we hoped and so uh, i'm currently without internet where i'm sleeping and i'm having to come here uh to record and to work etc etc i try to reschedule it with the internet provider but obviously uh the next date that they could come out was in like four weeks because that's just standard these days and unfortunately i can't wait that long so i'm in between it's a bit of a mess it's chaos i know um and i apologize that there's not been as many pods over the last few days uh as normal but i figured the international break was probably a good time to make this jump if you uh were going to miss the pod you'd probably miss it more uh when the football is active and and we've got loads to talk about rather than during the international break whereby it's normally quite quiet and there's not a great deal to discuss i also thought it was a good time to do a q a edition which is what we're going to do today and i've got some really juicy questions um i'm really delighted because sometimes as a content creator you put out a post and you ask for questions to come in and sometimes you get some really good ones And you think, wow, I can make a show out of that. And sometimes, with all due respect to the people that send them, you get some that are, shall we say, less interesting. And when they're less interesting, it's very, very difficult to make some kind of podcast slash content out of it. Today, though, I feel like we're in a great position. I've got loads to talk about, loads to get into, loads to discuss. And um, and all of the subjects have been put forward by you guys, our dear listeners. So thank you very, very much for that. Let's get into it then without further ado. Um, I should tell you that you should subscribe and like and all the rest of it and leave us a review for listening on audio. Also, you can check us out on patreon.com forward slash the Chronicles of Aguna, where lots of you have been signing up recently. So thank you so, so much. Uh, for that okay let's get into question number one um and this question is with regards to martin odegaard so the question is and it comes from matt is odegaard by not playing for norway missing out on the chance to get valuable minutes and it's a really really good question because martin odegaard had been out for a long period of time he returned for the game at Stamford Bridge, played the entire 90 minutes, which I don't think many people saw coming. He went out there, he gave an incredible account of himself. He he made a difference. I don't think he was at his brilliant best and I don't think Arsenal were anywhere near their brilliant best, but it was certainly Arsenal's best performance, I would argue, in the last month or so. And it was no coincidence that Martin Odegaard coming back into the team kind of sparked that and helped us with that. He's super important to Arsenal. And obviously, he's super important to his country as well. He's the captain of the Norwegian national team. And you can understand why they would really want him to be involved. We obviously want to protect him. We've been burnt by international breaks quite a bit at the start of this season. We've lost key players as a result of them going and picking up problems on international duty. And it's been a real struggle for us. So I get what people are saying with the whole, well, he looked a little bit rusty and if... He went and played two very low intensity, potentially easy games for Norway by his standards. That might help him return after the international break in something closer to his tip top shape. But I just think with Martin Odegaard, we're talking about a special case here. I think we're talking about somebody who is so naturally fit that the rust thing isn't anywhere near as much of an issue as it could be for, let's say, a Gabby Jesus someone whose minutes have been really limited, who's coming on and off the bench, who isn't performing at the level required. But you can always make that counter argument that without that routine, without that uh, consistency in his game time, that's why he is where he is. And that's why he's struggling. With Odegaard, I don't see it like that. And it takes me back to, and I made this point on a recent pod, but I'll just very, very quickly uh, reiterate it for those of you that haven't heard that. 
I remember when he first joined Arsenal, he joined in a January window and he hadn't barely played any football in the season up until that point. And he came and I looked at it and I went, loan signing, is it really worth it? Because by the time he gets up to speed, we're probably going to be in March. And by then, our hopes and aspirations and everything that we want to achieve may have passed us by. But he came in and he was just incredible. And very, very quickly he got up to speed. And watching him at Chelsea the other day play 90 minutes and kind of get back up to speed really quickly reminded me of that time and, and the way I felt about that signing at that point and, and how surprised I was, how taken aback I was by Martin Odegaard being as fit as he was. So I don't think rust and lack of match practice is as big an issue for Martin Odegaard as it is for other players. And therefore, I prefer that he's wrapped up in cotton wool um, and um, and protected because we cannot afford to lose him again. We've seen what's happened when we've lost him. We've lost our creative spark. We've lost our creative edge. We've lost our ability to break teams down. And it's been a really, really big problem for us. So I'm desperate um, to see him back playing regularly for Arsenal. I'm confident that he'll get up to speed nice and quickly. And so I prefer that he stays back. And it was interesting because Arsenal's position on this was was a weak one going into this conversation with the Norwegian Federation, right? Because we played him for 90 minutes against Chelsea. So on the one hand, you want your player to be protected and you're kind of giving the message of he's not ready, he's not ready, he's not ready. But Mikel Arteta just played him for 90 minutes. And so I think we did the right thing in allowing the discussion to take place between Odegaard and the Norwegian Federation, allowing it to happen between those guys. Don't tell the player that he can't play for his country. Don't force him to withdraw, but allow him the opportunity to have the conversation with the Federation. And we know that he travelled out to meet the squad and then they decided that it wasn't best uh, for him to participate. So in answer to the question, I've gone around the houses a little bit. Um, is Odegaard not playing for Norway, him missing out on the chance to get some valuable minutes? I think you can make that argument, but I think overall it's better that he's protected. It's better that he's rested because, as I say, with Martin Odegaard, Russ doesn't feel as big of an issue for me. OK, this is a really juicy question. Um, and this one comes uh, from another Matt, Matt Phillip, who says, what is your honest assessment of our squad building? Feels like we need a big signing in both the midfield and in the front line, both of which just aren't feasible. I think squad building is a really, really complex subject and topic. And I think you could do a whole pod on this. Maybe we will at some point. But I also think squad building can be misjudged and misread when you are coping with injuries. And that can lead to people questioning squad building to a point and to a level that's probably a little bit over the top when you think about the situation that we're in, right? So you look at the number of players we have, we have enough, um, theoretically speaking. You look at the cover that we have in most positions, we have enough, again, theoretically speaking. Over the course of the summer, we brought in what we called floor raisers in Mikel Marino, Ricardo Calafiori, um, Raheem Sterling was supposed to be that as well. I think is a debate at the minute whether he is or not, but that was what that signing was supposed to do. He was supposed to come in and raise the floor. He was supposed to be better than Reese Nelson and give us a, an upgrade in that position, a more experienced player, uh, someone that could do the job, someone that could do the role, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah. So I think the problem with with trying to judge whether the squad building was good or not is that there's just so many factors that can make the squad building look good or make it look bad. Like, for example, if you bring in a player who's a midfielder and does really, really well, and you're coping with midfield injuries and that player stepped in and filled that void, then you look at it and you go, oh, well, the squad building's been really, really good. But if you bring in a player who maybe takes a bit of time to get to grips with things, or you pick up multiple injuries in one position, which is what's happened to us at points this season, then you start to go, oh, the squad building's all wrong and that's why we are where we are. But actually, it might just be ridiculous that you've got three right backs, for example, out. Like a few weeks back, we weren't sure if Ben White, Jury and Timber could play and we had Takahiro Tomiyasu out. Now, I wouldn't look at that and say that's a problem with our squad building because we've got three 
very, very good right back options. It's just sod's bloody law that they're all injured at the same time. And so I don't think you can pin that on squad building, for example, right? So it's a really complex topic and subject. Where I would be critical of Mikel Arteta's squad building, if you like, right now, is that I think there's been too big an emphasis placed on the physical profiles of players. And I think that as a result of that, we've neglected what is required in terms of the technical side and the flair side. That's where I would be critical of what Mikel and Edu and everybody else involved uh, has built in recent years. You look at the situation that we found ourselves in this year without Martin Odegaard. Okay, I'm not saying that these players would have made the world of difference, but they're certainly closer in profile to Martin Odegaard than some of the alternative options. And as a result of that, we've had to change the way that we play. And that's taken some time to get used to. And it's meant that our identity has got lost a little bit. So, for instance, when we pick a midfield three, Martin Odegaard is the one charged with the creative responsibility more than anybody else. Yes, we like our deep lying midfielder to ping balls through lines. We like our left eight to carry the ball, to support the left winger, to get into those back post areas quite a bit when we work the ball out to Bukayo Saka. All of that is true. But creative players, we've let two of them go. We let Emil Smith-Rowe go, and I think it was good money. So in the grand scheme of things, I don't have an issue with that transfer. But we let him go. We let Fabio Vieira go, who, again, there's a debate around whether he's good enough, but again, falls into that category of creative midfield player. We let them go and we brought in players that don't match that profile. And so then when you lose your main creative force and whether they do it in the same way is a different story because they don't, if we're being honest. Like Emil Smith-Rowe is definitely more of a carrier than a passer. Um in my opinion, Martin Odegaard is more of a passer than a carrier. So they do different things and they do things in different ways, but ultimately they're trying to produce the same thing, which is that creative spark. So I think our squad building has gone a little bit wrong where we've really, really emphasised um, the want for physical, powerful players. And I think we've neglected what's required on the flair slash creativity side. So I'm not going to moan about the defence because I think we've had an unprecedented amount of injuries. There's been a problem in the midfield. We've struggled again with injuries, but the balance has been off as a result of us not having those other creative forces. And in attack, I think we've got enough bodies and enough players. There's just too many of them that are out of form at the moment. So if I had one criticism of the squad building, that's what it would be. The overemphasis on physical power and maybe the neglect of the flair and creative side of the game. And you need to have those players within your ranks, in my opinion, if you want to be the very, very best. Football is becoming increasingly a more physical sport. I agree with that, and I get that. And I understand why Mikel's gone down the route he has. I, I remember thinking back to Arsene Wenger's days and thinking towards the end, he, he, he went the opposite way. It was too much about flair and technicality, and it meant us. it meant that we were weak and we were soft-centred. And we couldn't hold our own in those physical battles, which is what a lot of people turn the games against us into. Arteta, I feel, has gone too far the other way. I think the right balance is somewhere in between. And when I look at Man City, when I look at Liverpool, they seem to have a better balance with regards to, yes, the physical power to be able to hold their own and battle, but also those players that give you that spark, the creativity can produce those magical moments that go beyond just what you can do physically. But it's, yeah. It's a really complex issue, squad building, but that's kind of my thoughts uh, on that. Next question uh, comes from Abhijit, who says, Arsenal have seven winnable games in a row now with an almost fully fit squad. Liverpool have four out of their next seven being very difficult games. I don't think it's over yet. So Abhijit confident that Arsenal is still in the tight race. Look, I've said it before. I've said it a lot in recent weeks. I'll say it again. I believe that right now we're out of it. I think that's how we should see it, but we should view it as a temporary position, a position that we can recover from, a position from which we can emerge if we go on a run. And if we go on a run between now and the end of the year, which is very possible, as you mentioned, with some of our fixtures, then we could be right back in it. But I'm not ready to say that we are right now, if that makes sense. Our next fixtures are Forest at home, West Ham away, Man United at home, Fulham away, Everton at home, Crystal Palace at home and Ipswich at home. 
I would say that we need three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, at least 19 points from those games. 19 points from a possible 21. If we can get 19 points from the next 21 available, then I will sit here and I'll say we're right back in the race. But Arsenal need to go out and do that first before my opinion on our standing in the title race is going to change. And he's also right to point out Liverpool's games because they play Southampton away next, which you think is a home banker. Uh, well, it's not a home game, it's an away game. It's an away banker as far as they go. But then they play City at home, Newcastle away, Everton away in a Merseyside derby. They take on Fulham at Anfield before travelling to Spurs and then they face Leicester. So there is potential for Liverpool to drop some points. But we're only going to be in a position to take advantage of that if we bring back, bring home at least 19 of the 21 points available. That's what's in my head. Now, that might change because if Liverpool drop more points than I anticipate them to drop, then maybe we don't need 19. Maybe we can get away with 17. Who knows? We're going to have to see how it goes. You've got to take it week by week. But the point I'm trying to make is Abidji is bang on when he says that there is the possibility and the potential for us to drag ourselves back into the title race over this next seven fixtures. Next question comes from uh, Leeds Cleeds 94. That's his uh, screen name. He says, what is the bare minimum we can accept as fans come May? If we end the season trophyless, discussions need to be held regarding Mikel's position. <sighs> it's really tough in it to, to kind of, to, to give a definitive answer on this, because again, as with a lot of things, context is really, really important. Okay. The context could be that we've been ravaged by injuries all season and we managed to finish second and made it to the semi-finals of the Champions League. Everybody would look at that and say that's a disappointment. But if the context is one whereby that feels like an overachievement, then you kind of view it for a very, very different lens. I know that you want me to say if Mikel Arteta doesn't win the Premier League or the Champions League, he should be sacked. But I'm not going to say that because I don't think football needs to be that binary all the time. And that's one of the big problems with our game today. It drives me insane. I don't think it needs to be that binary. I think I'd have to judge that at the end of the season. If we fail to achieve our goals because I believe that he made wrong decisions along the way, then I'd quite happily sit here and say that actually maybe we need to think about Mikel Arteta's role in that failure and what that means for the future. But I'm not there right now and I don't want to put a label on, on what we should be doing. Look, the bare minimum is a serious title challenge again. And when I say serious, take it to the final few weeks. And we have to go further in the Champions League than we did last year because we need to be showing progress year upon year. And if we're not doing that, then what are we doing? Like some people say, well, he needs to win a trophy and they'll say, well, he needs to win the Carabao Cup or he needs to win the FA Cup. I'll be honest with you guys. If he wins the Carabao Cup, I'll enjoy it for the day. I'll go to Wembley. I'll have a great time. I've never seen Arsenal win the League Cup because the last time it happened, I was three years old. I don't remember it. I would love to see that. It's the one that I haven't seen us win, along with the Champions League, but in terms of the domestic cups, of course. But it isn't really going to dictate my opinion on whether the, se the season was a success or a failure. Because to me, there is a clear hierarchy with the trophies that are available. I would rather go one round further in the Champions League than win the Carabao Cup. And I know not everyone will agree with that. I understand that's a controversial opinion, but that's genuinely how I feel about that competition. So, yeah, we'll see. But it would it would silence those that say trophy or bust, wouldn't it? Because it would be a trophy. And if you've been beating that drum of trophy or bust for Mikel Arteta this season and he wins a trophy, you ain't got a leg to stand on really to criticise him because to you, that's all it was about. And if it is all it's about and he's delivered that, then what's your problem is, is what I'd say to those people. But anyway, um, it's hard to say because we don't know how the season's going to pan out. But I've still got hope that we can drag ourselves back into the title race. And I've still got hope that we can be very competitive on the European stage. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll see how we go. OK, next question. This one comes from Grady, who says, do you feel like Jesus's time is absolutely up now? We have consistently brought him on at times when we need a goal and he's persistently failed to deliver. I mean, I've got to be honest, I'm struggling with Gabby Jesus at the minute. When we were going into the season, I looked at Gabby Jesus and I thought, this is a big old year for you, my friend. Like you need to get back to something like the level that you showed us in the past. You need to get back to something like the player 
that arrived at our football club and won our hearts instantly. Like we need that. We need that Gabby Jesus back. And I was quite confident that we would see that Gabby Jesus. I was well aware of the injury problems that he experienced last season. Um, the fact that that would have um, impacted his ability to perform at the highest level. And obviously he had the knee injury. Then he had some follow-up issues that were related to that knee injury, fluid on the knee, minor procedures needed to take place, et cetera, et cetera. But I thought with a full preseason, we'd see a much better version of the Gabby Jesus that we're watching today. And he's gone through these periods in his career where people have seriously questioned the number of goals. And I always knew that we'd have that conversation about Gabby Jesus actually quite frequently. But what I didn't think was that he'd become totally ineffective in the other elements and components of his game. So bringing other people into the game, the pressing, all of that stuff has dropped off with Gabriel Jesus big time. And that's why I'm really struggling with him at the minute. Having said that, I did think at Inter, he showed the sharpest performance. And I know it wasn't for the whole game, it was for a half, but he looked sharper in that 45 minutes, I thought, than he had done all season up until that point. So I'm not completely writing the guy off. Like I, I do feel like we might get him closer to the level that he was at, but I've accepted that we're never going to see the Gabriel Jesus Arsenal that we saw when he first arrived at the club and literally along with Alexander Zinchenko turn this team around completely and set us on our way to where we are today. So I don't want to disrespect the guy. I still think he's a good squad option, but I am struggling right now to understand the full value of Gabriel Jesus because it's clear to me that um, he's nowhere near where we know he can be. Next question from Ricky Mack. Uh, As of late, we find ourselves getting a lot of crosses into the box and not making anything of them. Could it be a good idea to look for a striker with Giroud style qualities to play alongside Kai? I think Arsenal did. I think Arsenal did in the summer want to get Benjamin Sesko in. I think they looked at him as the number one option. There were other options out there. I know a lot of Arsenal fans are very, very big on the idea of signing Victor Gyokares, for example. But I think with Victor Gyokares, there was there was doubt around whether we should be looking to pay the 80 plus million pounds that Sporting wanted. I think Arsenal felt that Benjamin Shesko was as talented, but also probably available at much less. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there was some kind of clause in his contract that would have allowed us to do a deal if we did it during a certain point, um, whereby we could have got him a lot cheaper. But there's a part of me that is frustrated we didn't get that striker in, but there's also a part of me that thinks, well, if options one and two aren't available, then you don't just settle. You don't just go and buy someone for the sake of it. Will they do that in January? Maybe not. Um, it's not always easy to do those kind of deals in January. P- clubs don't tend to plan for those types of deals in January. Um, and Benjamin Shesko, if he is the one that they want, he's made it quite clear that he wants to be at RB Leipzig for this season at least. So maybe that's one we revisit in the summer. But I don't think Kai Havertz is a problem when it comes to putting balls into the box. I think he's very, very good in that department. I think the, r- the reason that we look at it and we think that we need that type of player because let's make no mistake about it Kai Havertz is a big physical powerhouse and he's become that even more so since joining Arsenal where he has really put himself about in a way that I didn't think he was capable of I think the problem is is that in recent months where we've been without other players we've had to adjust his role and he hasn't been playing as the out and out centre forward that we need him to be if we're going to go down the road of putting loads of crosses into the box Don't have him dropping as deep. Don't have him going left and right. Don't have him rotating positions with Leandro Trossard and instruct him to stay in those areas. And I'm sure you get more out of Kai Havertz right now. And myself and Mike Stavrou are going to have a good chat about Kai Havertz on the Patreon pod that we'll be releasing um, on Saturday as well. So, yeah, um, it's an interesting one. I think we could do with another striker. I think we've always felt that. But. I don't think that's our biggest issue right now. I think the creativity from deeper in the side is, has been the problem more so than who it is that's on the end of those chances. But that's just my view. Okay, uh, Johnny has got a question that's kind of related. Again, it's with regards to Kai Havertz. He says, is Kai Havertz really the best we can do up front? He's not good enough as a striker or a midfielder. Um, is he preventing us from getting a real striker? We're going to talk about that on the Patreon pod. So I'm going to park that one. It's a really good question. It's a really valid question. I know a lot of people feel that way. So we'll address that on the Patreon pod. Remember, you can sign up to us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the Chronicles of Aguna. Big thank you to all of you for your support. 
over there it allows me to keep the pod going to spend more time on it and um yeah thank you for your support the question i want to finish off uh on today is with regards to something that isn't arsenal related but has made all of the headlines over the last few days and that is with regards to premier league official david coote now a video came out i think it was earlier in the week or maybe back in the last week where he was talking about Jurgen Klopp and he called him some pretty nasty things, um, you know, called him arrogant and some words that obviously I can't say on the podcast. And that caused a lot of uh, frustration among the Liverpool fans who, you know, started to look for examples or, or not look for, maybe they already knew them, but started to highlight examples of where they felt that David Coote had been unfair to them in the way that he officiated some of their games. Um, the PGMOL came out and said they were investigating David Coote. And over the past 24 hours, another video has emerged of David Coote essentially appearing to be doing drugs. Um, and that has sparked a lot of debate around whether David Coote uh, should keep his position, how severe the punishment should be. I mean, the debate around whether or not he should continue as a Premier League official has been going on ever since that first video emerged, right? And this has just added fuel to the fire. I'll tell you what this looks like to me. This looks like someone is out to get David Coote, somebody that was perhaps within his circle of trust that he allowed to capture him doing these things on camera has just decided that either there's some money to be earned or there's some revenge to be had against him or their relationship is broken down and he's going to go out there and he's going to absolutely ruin the guy. My view on this is very, very simple. Okay. Are we all perfect? No, we're not. We've all got our faults. We've all said things that we shouldn't have said. We've all done things that we shouldn't have done. And anybody who sits there and saying, oh, I'm the righteous one and I've never done a thing wrong is a complete and utter liar. Okay. That's, that's the reality of the situation. When it comes to David Coote, do I think he should continue as his, uh, as a Premier League official? Probably not. Okay. Because I think when you come out and you say something or, or when you're seen saying something like that, whether you carry a bias going into matches or not, it's something that's always going to be dug up and it's always going to be used against you. And it's going to make your life very difficult. And it's going to make the PGMOL's life, the PGMOL, by the way, who are already under incredible scrutiny, it's going to make their life really, really hard as well. So if you're of the opinion that David Coote should no longer officiate in the Premier League anymore, I can't really argue with that. Personally, I wouldn't sack the guy. Um, I, I wouldn't do it because I think that we've seen too many examples over the years of people of a high profile being involved in scandals that were blown out of proportion that were turned into something that they're not by people who pretend to be offended when actually they're not like I get why a Liverpool fan would watch that video and think that's ridiculous. Get rid of him. I completely understand that, but I don't get why like a Birmingham fan or a Northampton fan is sitting there going, Oh my God, this is a, I'm offended by this. This is a complete and utter disgrace. And it's a place that we've got to in society that I think is really, really uncomfortable. There are far worse things in the world and far worse things said and broadcast to massive audiences than Jurgen Klopp is a beep and he's arrogant. He might have said that about Mikel Arteta if he was asked. He might have said that about, uh, Thomas Frank, he might have said that about anyone that he's had a run in with, right? We, we've all worked with people that we didn't really get on with and we've had to put up with, but maybe didn't see eye to eye with. Now, I'm not defending what David Coote's done, to be clear, because I don't think you should even be saying that in your position in an environment where you're being filmed. OK, but let's not all pretend that everything we say on camera is the exact same things that we would say at home behind closed doors when we feel like we're in a safe environment. The guy messed up. It's out there. It's done him damage. He'll serve whatever punishment he's going to get from the PGMOL and his job could be in jeopardy. That is bad enough. That is bad enough. Mentally, that kind of thing takes its toll on an individual. And I just think as a society, as people, have we not learned? Have we not learned from previous examples of high profile people being caught up in 
scandals that in truth don't really have any impact on most people and crucifying them for it or, or are leading these witch hunts against them sparking it all constantly repeatedly posting stuff on social media about it creating a situation that is much bigger than it needs to be then we see those people struggle to deal with it and cope with it and unfortunately and this is the reality of the situation some of those people that have been caught up in these types of things that ultimately didn't really have an impact on anybody else or most other people those people have struggled to deal with those things so much so that they're not here to tell us the tale anymore. And that is really, really sad. So have your opinion on David Coote as a referee. Have your opinion on whether or not he uh, he should be um, allowed to continue in his role as a Premier League official. And whatever side of the fence you sit on on that, I can see the argument and I'm cool with that. But why do we as people seem to revel in the destruction of others? Why do we as people seem to revel in the idea of somebody else being dragged through the mud? Now, again, let me be clear. This isn't specifically about David Coote. This isn't because David Coote is a saint or anything like that. I just don't understand why we all like to pile on and make what's already a very, very difficult time for someone much worse. Like, where is the empathy? Like, he hasn't killed someone. He hasn't done anything unforgivable. He's called someone a name. It should never have got out. And he's silly and he's naive for that to have happened. And you could argue that it's had an impact on the way that he's officiated Liverpool if you want to. And again, if I were a Liverpool fan, I'd, I'd be furious about it. But I do think even if I were a Liverpool fan at this point, watching the way his world is sort of crashing down around him and people are going after him and finding more videos and this and that. And the, the irony of it is, is that most of the idiots that have gone massive on this on social media do exactly what David Coote was caught doing in that second video that went out yesterday every bloody weekend. But it's the whole hypocrisy of it that upsets me and annoys me, right? The guy is probably going to lose his job. The guy is probably never going to work in a position that he's worked all his life to get into ever again. That is enough. That is enough punishment for what he's done. Like the punishment should not be bigger than the offense. Like, and that's the problem, right? He's not killed someone. He's not hurt anybody. He's not done anything of the sort. And I just think we need to be realistic about, you know, the level and the scale of the witch hunt towards David Coote right now. I, I posted something on X last night and this kind of sums up my thoughts on this. So I'll leave you with this rather than going around the houses and, and sort of repeating myself. But I do feel quite strongly about this. I said, whatever your view on the David Coote stuff, whether you think he should continue in his role or not, I'll never understand why so many people enjoy watching others be dragged through the mud. We've seen so many examples of high profile people struggle to deal with scandals and unfortunately, they're not all still here to tell the tale. Mentally, it takes its toll. Do we never learn? There are much bigger crimes going on in the world right now that we should be calling out, that we should be demanding punishment for. Someone saying what David Coote said or doing what David Coote was caught doing in the other video I'm not saying it's good. It's obviously bad. It's obviously bad. But does it warrant the guy mentally being battered from every single angle? Just think about how your reactions and your posts can have an impact on the individual that's going through this at the moment. I'm, I'm the last person to have sympathy for referees. I don't have sympathy for David Coote, the referee. I have sympathy for David Coote, the man who's probably dealing with a lot right now. And the level of destruction this has caused, that's enough punishment for the offence. And to keep doing this and to keep going after him and to keep bringing up other stuff and to keep constantly hammering him to the point where he might not be able to recover, I just think lacks empathy. And quite frankly, it's horrible. But anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you so, so much for joining me on this uh, Q&A episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. We'll be back with another one very, very soon. Uh, we've got one coming out tomorrow, one coming out on Friday. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. One coming out on Saturday as well on the Patreon side of things. So make sure you stay tuned and I'll see you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Goodbye.